Well, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We're continuing, of course, our study of the gospel of Matthew. And when you, when you look at the gospels, there are four of them, and each one presents Jesus in a different way. Matthew presents him as the king, Mark as the servant, Luke as the man, and John presents him as God. So as we look at Matthew, we're seeing the king of the Jews. And what we've seen in these, these weeks, we saw, and if you have your your little card, and if you don't have one, there's one out on the table out there as you go out. Uh, we've seen the background of the king. We showed that he was a descendant, that Jesus was a descendant of Abraham and David. And then we showed the, what we call the platform of the king, in which is Matthew's chapters 5, 6, and 7, in which basically is Sermon on the Mount. And now we're in what we're calling the, the power of the king, because we're seeing Jesus and what he can do. And, and the only reason he's doing that now is so they'll understand who he is. That, that because if, because Jesus heals people and he shows his great power. But the bottom line is, if Jesus came to heal, he failed. Because he didn't heal everybody. He came to demonstrate who he is. And part of these signs, part of these things that he do, does, is to show that he is the king of the Jews. Now this morning we're going to see several things as we look at this passage. First of all, we're going to talk about discipleship. What, what is this? How does it differ from salvation? Some people do not see a distinction or some people are confused and we'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about faith, which is trusting God in the events of life because we're going to see these guys get in a boat and then a big storm comes. And Jesus says, you men of little faith. We'll talk about that. And then we'll continue to see his power. Jesus Jesus' power over nature, and in fact, even dealing with demons, and we'll see how that works. So, some great stuff. You know, we, uh, I was listening the other day, I work out real early, and I happened to be working out, and the news thing was on, and the person said that on, I think it was May 3rd, or I think it was May 3rd, uh, which was the day that 79 tornadoes came through Oklahoma, and that was when 40-something people were killed. And, you know, you think about those terrible storms, and there's such power there. And if you ever, uh, you know, see them on television or even experience them, uh, years ago, we were, in, when we lived in Stillwater on the other side of town, the tornado came through that part of the town, and, and it missed our house, but it hit some other houses right around us and even destroyed some, some things. And I can remember I got up, and uh, uh, Sarah wasn't born yet, and Jean and Catherine were in the hall, and I, and I went and looked at our, at our sliding glass window and we had a wooden fence and while I was looking the fence just blew away I went I think I better go back over here but you know <laughs> it, you see the power of the storms well in, in, in this passage this morning we're going to see a powerful storm because these fishermen that's what they are fishermen they get in the boat with Jesus he says let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and a storm comes up and they're afraid now they've been on that they've been on that sea all of their lives and so this must be a really big storm for them to be afraid, and we'll see it. And as we look at this, we're going to see the power of the king. What he does is he calms the storm, and we're going to see some other things that he does. So when we look at Matthew, uh, remember that this section, chapters 8 through 10, we clearly see the power of the king. And that's what we're going to see over the next two to three to four lessons as we continue to go through these chapters. Now, what we saw last time, we saw that he touched a leper. That's all he did. This leper, which, which nobody touches a leper, and a leper leper wasn't supposed to touch anybody because if they touch somebody, then they're unclean and everybody's going to get the disease and everything. So you didn't touch a leper and the leper didn't touch you. This leper came up to Jesus and said, if you're, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus said, I'm willing. He touched him and healed him just like that. And, and then he went in and, and Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever and he raised, you know, basically healed her. And then uh, the, about the centurion had a young slave and he, and he healed that person. And then in verses 16 and 17, which is about where we're going to start, it said, the evening came and they brought to him many who were demon-possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word, healed those who were ill. I mean, we see that he's doing amazing things. He had just come from the synagogue, comes in there, heals Peter's Peter's mother, it becomes the evening, which means it's now the Sabbath is now over, and these people just gather at the door. And we talked about how Jesus didn't just walk out and say, thank you all for coming, you're all healed. It says not only in Matthew, but in Mark and some of the others, that he basically took the time to deal with each person. That's, that's what he's like. He's, he's amazing. Now, as we continue this morning, we're going to see Jesus' power, and we're going to see it over nature because he calms a storm. But then we see it over to this, de really demons, you could put demons, but it's over, it should be demons, because he cast out evil spirits. But, but there's something else involved. 
There's a discipleship thing. Sometimes we miss it because, you know, the truth is you read the Bible and sometimes we read the Bible fast or we've read passages that we've read so many times we don't always stop and say, wait a minute, what did I just read? And in this section, we're going to see three things. We're going to see discipleship, which is counting the cost in verses 18 through 22, then the power over nature, which is the storm, and then the power over demons. And so we're going to see this. Now, <clears throat> Jesus, he's in Capernaum. On, not on this map is Nazareth. It's back over that way. And he, start, he went to Nazareth. You remember they got all mad at him because <laughs> they realized that he, 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 he kind of got on them. And so they ran him out of town. And he goes to Capernaum and he starts the ministry at Capernaum. And he goes, travels all over and all around. Most people think that the Sermon on the Mount, the part that we saw in chapters 5, 6, and 7, most people think it was on this side of the Sea of Galilee. Nobody knows for sure. They're going to get in the boat today and they're going across the Sea of Galilee to this region right here. This is called the Gadarenes. Gadara, it's called the Gadarenes, and they're going to be right on the edge of the shore because there's a bunch of pigs going to run into the Sea of Galilee. So they're not, they're not all the way up here. They're right in here when they get out of the boat, and we're going to see what happens as they go through this. We're going to take a look at the subject of discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple, and what does it cost to be a disciple. Look at verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, they're all around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. So he's gonna get, they're going to get in the boat, and they're going to leave Capernaum, and they're going to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. People are all around him, and he says, let's get in, and let's go to the other side. Before they get into the boat, two men come up to Jesus. And look, look what it says. And we're going to see the idea of discipleship. Let me just read verse 19. It says, then a, then a scribe came up. Now, that's unusual. A scribe? I'll talk about it in a second. A scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, we need to talk about something for just a second. We need to realize there's a difference between discipleship and salvation. If you've been at our church for any length of time, you already know this. This is not new. You may be here for the first time this morning. or may you never put some of this together. But there's a difference between salvation and discipleship. Salvation costs us nothing. It is a gift. By grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation costs us absolutely nothing. We trust in Jesus Christ. He gives to us eternal life. It's not our works, our goodness, or anything. Discipleship costs us everything. Because discipleship is when you die to yourself. It's when you say, I want to serve Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. In Luke 14, it says, you die to yourself. You take up your cross and die to self. And so when you think about it, salvation is free while discipleship costs. We trust in Jesus Christ and we have salvation. That's free. We give our life to serve God and you have discipleship. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now, understand there's a difference. I've had people say, well, you need to give your life to Jesus to be saved. Is that a service thing? Are you saying, I'm going to serve Jesus Christ to be saved? That's works. That's going to cost you. Salvation doesn't cost you anything. You believe in Jesus Christ, and he gives you, as a gift, eternal life. But to serve him, to live for him, to follow him, to be a disciple is going to cost you your life. You actually say to God, I give you my life. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. That's what it's about. Now, our church... We just had a congregational meeting back at, at 9.45 this morning in the Grow Group time, and we talked about our purpose of our church. Our purpose of our church is to make disciples. There's twofold. Lead people to Christ, that's salvation. Train them and teach them to follow Jesus Christ, to live for Christ and grow. That's discipleship. That's our whole goal. Our goal is not just to make believers. Our goal is to make disciples. And so notice, you trust in Christ, you're saved and saved forever. That's the gift of eternal life. But to serve him, to be a disciple, you say, I want my life to count for Christ. Well, look at this. Look at verse 19. A scribe came and said to him. Now, scribes, they were like religious type leaders. They, the scribes were the ones that copied the Bible. And I mean, they were meticulous. It, you know, Hebrew goes back this way. It goes from right to left. And they, they would write it down and they would write it perfectly. Every letter, when they were copying the Bible, they had everything exact. And if anything was wrong, they just tore the whole thing up and started over. These were meticulous people. And most of the scribes did not believe in Jesus, just like most of the religious leaders didn't believe in Jesus. This scribe comes up and says, teacher, he calls him rabbi, and he says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So this man is not, has already trusted in Christ, but he's saying, not only have I trusted in you, I want to follow you. Now, Jesus wants people to understand that salvation costs nothing, but following him costs. 
And so he wants them to understand there's a cost involved in saying, I will follow you. And let me tell you this. I hope every one of us in this room that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. It's a gift. It costs you absolutely nothing. You take the gift of eternal life. But if you decide that you're going to be a disciple, and you should be a disciple, if you decide that, it's going to cost you. You're going to say to God, I give up my life. I die for you. I want to go wherever you want me to go. I want to do whatever you want me to do. I want to be faithful. I want my life to count for you. The gifts, talents, abilities, time, money, possession, everything I give to you. That's going to cost you. It costs you your life. And that's why in discipleship, Jesus would say something like, take up your cross and follow me. That's die to yourself. So this guy says, I'll follow you wherever I go. And Jesus wants to remind him that there's a cost involved. And so he says, hey, wait a minute. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said, listen, when you follow me, there aren't any guarantees as far as this earth and there's no the possession end of it. And look, there's just no place. And, and you just never know. And see, when we follow Jesus, there's no permanent ties to this earth. We say, I'll follow you if I have a good house or a good car. I'll follow you if I can live in the south. Or I'll follow you if, I, you know. Now, he says, listen, what, as believers, our citizenship is in heaven. We're just passing through. And the bottom line is, we don't say, I got all my stuff. We say, this is really your stuff. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. And so this guy actually came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, wherever you go. And he said, well, it's going to cost you now. Just remember that if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you. And, and notice uh, what Jesus calls himself in verse 28. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds there have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay us. The Son of Man is the title back in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. That's the title of the Messiah. So when Jesus calls himself Son of Man, he's saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. And he says the Messiah and the Savior of the world doesn't have anything here that holds him back. I'm doing the will of the Father. I have come to do the will of the Father. And so wherever I go, you want to follow me? Just remember, then don't be hanging on to all this stuff. That's basically what he says. Now we're going to meet a second man. And look what happens. This is discipleship as well. Another of the disciples. Now this is not even a scripture. This is a disciple. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now that sounds okay, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Let, let me go bury my father. Now it would be okay if his father just died. That's not what he's saying. He's actually saying, listen, I'd like to follow you, but what I want to do first is when my father dies, I get my inheritance. When I get my inheritance, I'll follow you. That's what he's actually saying. He's not saying my father just died because we can tell by Jesus' answer. Jesus' answer, he said, wait a minute, whoa, verse 22. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. What's he, what's he saying? Jesus is saying, look, follow me because let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. He said, you're spiritually alive. You, if you belong to me, you can't be worrying about your inheritance and what's going to happen over here. The bottom line is you should say, I'll leave that to them, and I'll go do what God wants me to do. It's basically let those who are not concerned for the things of God deal with that. You have more important things to do. Discipleship costs you. And a lot of us say, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a disciple. Well, are we? Salvation is a gift, and to have eternal life costs us absolutely nothing, and it's the grace of God. And by faith alone and Christ alone, we're saved, and we're saved forever, and nothing can ever change it. But to be a disciple, to say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you your life. That's what Jesus talks about. And that's why Jesus in another place said, if you, whoever, you know, put your hand in the plow, don't be looking back. He said, I'm going to live for Christ, but there's a lot of good stuff over here. No, either you're going to live for Christ or you're not. That, I'm, I'm not saying that when you live for Christ, you give up. Uh, I mean, that you might not have much possessions or anything. He's not even talking about that. He's saying, what is your life? What do you want to do with your life? To be a disciple means to put your relationship with Jesus Christ above anything else. And you just say, I want my life to count for Christ. I love Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott died in the early 50s. Uh, he went to the Alka Indians with the Wadani Indians in Ecuador, that part of the world, South America. And here's what he said. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You give away your life, which you can't keep your life anyway, to gain what you can't lose, which is eternal life with Jesus Christ and the rewards. So let me ask you a question. I hope and pray that every one of you in this room have trusted in Jesus Christ your Savior, and you know that you have eternal life. But what about being a disciple? We want to change the world. 
The world changes by disciples, by us giving our lives and saying, we're going to go wherever God wants us to go. We're going to do whatever he wants us to do. We want our lives to count for Christ. Look at this quote right here. Robert Chapman was once asked, would you advise young Christians to do something for the Lord? He said, no. No was the reply. I would advise them to do everything for the Lord, not some things. Everything. I trusted Christ when I was 19. Didn't understand anything. Thought you had to be good to go to heaven. Wondered in a Bible study. Shut the door. Couldn't get out. Heard the truth. Believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I have eternal life. And from that exact moment, I knew I had eternal life. If you asked me any time, 19, 20, 21, 22, all the way. If you said, do you think you're going to heaven? I said, of course I am. Why? Because I put my faith in Christ. He's given me eternal life. I'm saved and saved forever. It wasn't until I was about 26 years old. I was coaching in Mississippi State. Uh, it wasn't until that point I came and said, Lord, I want my life to count for you. I understand that there's a difference, that, that salvation, you've saved me and I'm saved forever. But all this, these years, these five, six years, I've just sort of been messing around. From this point on, I want my life to count for you. That's a big decision. I don't know where you are. You may say, look, I, I've trusted Christ. I know I have eternal life. But have you said to God... Lord, I want my life to count for you. You want to make a difference? You want to change? You want to change you and you want to change the world? You say, Lord, I give you my life. Bonhoeffer, most of you know who he was. He was uh, a German pastor who was executed by the Nazis because of his testimony for Jesus Christ. He did not yield to the state church. He stood strong and they finally got him and arrested him and killed him. He said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die to call in his discipleship. So, just a thought for all of us in this room. Where are you? If, I hope and pray you've all trusted Christ. It cost you nothing. It's a gift. If you haven't, give Jesus Christ your life for service as a disciple. Consider it. Be thinking about it. And that's a big decision. Well, let's see the power of the king. Let's see the power of the king. Because now, he's going to get into the boat. And you remember, what he's going to do is he's going to leave Capernaum, and they're going to, it's a long way here. See, sometimes they'd get in the boat and they'd go to there, and that's not very far. It's pretty, it's faster than walking all the way around. This time they're going to get in the boat and go all the way down to right in here, and, and this is called the region of the Gadarenes. That's where they're going to go, and let's see what happens. Now, uh, on the way, they come into a storm. So let's see what happens. Look at verse 23. When he, when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. So they all get in the boat. And then it's, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves, but Jesus himself was asleep. Now think about that. The, 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 by the way, the word about the sea, the storm, literally means shaking of the sea. Everything was shaking. Now you're, you're in this boat. You're fishermen, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and uh, they, they're all fishermen. They've fished all their lives. They've been on the Sea of Galilee Hundreds of times, probably every day of their lives, they were on the Sea of Galilee. They're on the Sea of Galilee, they probably made this trip a number of times, and all of a sudden the storm comes up, and it's such a bad storm that the sea is shaking, the sea is going up, water's coming into the boat, and what's Jesus doing? Is he back there going, I don't know what we're going to do? Jesus is asleep. He's asleep. You know what he told them? He said, We're going to go to the, one of the other gospels says, We're going to go to the other side. They don't really believe that. They think they're going to drown. They don't think they're going to make it to the other side. Look what happens. The, when he got into the boat, and behold, there arose this great storm on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. Wow. In fact, literally in the Greek it says, he was keeping on sleeping. <laughs> and you can just see him. And they came back to him, and they said to him, and they woke him up, and they said, save us, Lord, we are perishing. You know, they didn't say... Yeah. You know, what about Jesus? Is he perishing? Save us, Lord. Save us. We're perishing. They, hadn't, they haven't grasped yet who exactly is. They've trusted him. They understand he's the Messiah and the Savior. But you've got to understand, we, we look at it now and we see everything. We have the whole Bible. We have the New Testament. We have the Old Testament. We have everything. And, and we go, those guys, don't they get it? Let me tell you, what do you think we'd be doing? We'd be on that thing waking him up, probably. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? See, faith always has the object. And their object of their faith is Jesus, but they had little faith because they weren't believing him. They weren't believing they were going to make it to the other side. He's already shown them his power. He's already healed people. He's already done all kinds of things. And so what does he do? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly 
gone. Can you imagine that? Right in the middle of a storm, all of a sudden, it just stops. It just stops. What did they think about it? They were amazed. They were amazed. This word means to be outside yourself. It was like, oh my gracious. And then they looked at each other and they said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Uh, by the way, this, this word is hupo akuo. Hupo means under and akuo means to hear. That's what obedience means. It means to come under here. Jesus Christ can say, stop wind. It's over. He can say this. Remember, he healed the guy. He said, you can go back. Your servant is well. He didn't have to go there. He can do anything he wants to do. He can say the word and it's done. He can be there in touch. He doesn't have to be there in touch. He can stop the storm. He can do anything he wants to do because he is the one that is the creator of all things. Nature is under his authority. Think about it. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. He's, he's, he's calmed the sea. But now we got something else. We saw earlier that he had cast out these demons as they all came at the house where Peter's mother, you know, at Peter's mother-in-law's house. And remember that night they all came and he healed them? Well, something is about to happen. And look what happens in verse 28. When he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Now, if you read the other Gospels, most of the other Gospels writers only talk about one of the two men. Matthew happens to talk about both of the men. There were two men that were demon-possessed, and they were both so, so many demons were inside these men that they were like crazy people. They had strength. If you read some of the other Gospels, people would put them into shackles, and they would break the shackles. They would take rocks and cut themselves during the day. They didn't sleep. They wandered in a, in a graveyard. And remember, our, the graveyards weren't like tombstones. They were, they were all this stuff up against the sides of hills and things, and, and they would wander around, and they made noise, and people were afraid to go by there. They said, you don't pass by those two guys. might jump on you and beat you up. There's no telling what they would do to you. They're crazy because they're demon-possessed. And so it says that when they came to the other side of, into the land of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass this way. The other gospel said that as Jesus and the guys got off the boat onto the shore, they came running to Jesus. Now, if you were the guys, everybody's probably heard of these people. You could probably see them. I don't know. what We maybe ought to get back in the boat. These guys are running toward us. They did. They ran toward Jesus. And here's what they said. And they cried out, saying, What business do you have with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us? Now, let's talk for just a second. I just did a study last fall called Angels and Demons. And, and people can be demon-possessed. The demons, uh, power over demons, we're going to see this. People can be demon-possessed. It, it, it seems to be manifested greater when Jesus was on the earth. And we can see that there is a demon. His name is Lucifer, who was a, called the prince of the power of the air. He controls the fallen world system. God allows a demon to control the fallen world system. That's his allowing. We call him Lucifer. We call him Satan. We call him the devil. And there are demons, angelic beings, that are fallen angels, fallen de beings, we call demons, that are, serve Satan and actually affect people and affects the world. There's going to come a time that, is, that that's not going to be, but that's the way it is now. And so as Jesus gets there, these two men come running up, but they're controlled by demons. And, and let, let, let's talk for a second about Lucifer and Satan. He has a plan. I want you to see his plan. This is a very simple plan, and that is to keep people, keep men from trusting Jesus Christ. Let me tell you. All of the religions of the world sound good, be religious, that's all satanic. His plan is that people would never trust Christ. Religion is man doing something to please God. If, think of all the religions of the world, whether it's Buddhism, or Hinduism, or Islam, or Confucianism, or you just start naming it, they're all where man does something to somehow get to God. 
That's called religion. That's all satanic because Satan does not want a human being to understand that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ and he is the way, the truth, and the life and the salvation. And it's not by works, by what people do. It is simply by faith. So he wants to keep people from trusting Christ. There are people in our town that go to church every Sunday and they've never put their faith in Christ. They've thought that by going to church, being good, going to Sunday school, giving money, getting baptized, they've thought that somehow that saves them. That's the lie of Satan. Satan's plan is to keep people from ever trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. Now for all of us in this room that's trusted Christ, it's too late. We already trusted Christ. So he's got a second plan for us and that's to stop believers from ever serving him. That's the plan. And he wants you to get all tied up in the world, tied up in materialism, tied up in everything else. He would never want you to become a disciple. He would never want you to say, I give my life to Christ. He wants you to say, no, 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 don't do that. There's too many other good things. Think of all the places you can go and the things you can see and the possessions you can have and all the stuff that you can do to fulfill your own self. That's what Satan wants for us believers. But us believers, we want to say, no, 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 no. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a disciple for Jesus Christ. Because his plan, keep people from ever trusting, and then once we trust, keep us from ever serving. So look at verse 29. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Now notice what these demons call Jesus. They call him the Son of God. They knew exactly who he is. They call him the Son of God. And they're basically saying, Let's, what do you have to do with me? Have you come to torment us before our time? You understand that Jesus Christ is going to judge the fallen angels, the demons. He's going to judge them. And I want you to think about this. They knew that he, they, the demons knew Jesus' power, that he's in complete control, and they know that there will be time Jesus Christ will judge both man and demons. There's a place called the Lake of Fire. In Matthew chapter 24, the, the lake of fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. They know that one day, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will cast them into the lake of fire. So they say, have you come to torment us before our time? Now, Matthew writes this and says, now there was this herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The Gospel of Mark tells us there were 2,000 pigs on the side of that hill where they are. The demons begin to entreat him, saying, if you're going to cast us out, because they knew he was, send us into the herd of swine. Send us into the pigs. You know, I, I don't know why they wanted to go in pigs. I mean, who, who knows? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe they didn't want to be just floating around without some kind of body to be in, you know? They're spirit beings. So what does Jesus do? Jesus said, go. And they came out and went into the pigs, into the swine, and the whole herd, 2,000 of them, rushed down the sweep, steep bank into the sea and perished. Now, what if, what if those are your pigs? You got 2,000 pigs? They just went right down and drowned. Uh, and you're the shepherd guy going, ay, ay, what are we going to do about our pigs? Let me ask you something. The Jewish people supposed to be growing, basically raising pigs? No, they're not. No, they're not. And, and so the pigs, and so whew, right in there. And so what happened? The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. You know what happened to the demoniacs? The two men? Demons left them and they went, I feel a lot better than I used to feel. I can actually talk now. I can actually... How come I don't have any clothes on? I mean, that's basically, you know, because they've been crazy. They've been cutting themselves. They've been, you know, and so uh, the herdsmen ran away, went to the city, reported everything, including what had happened, and the whole, the whole city came to meet Jesus. If we stopped right there, that would sound good because, you know, every time you go someplace and the whole city comes out, they all come out and he comes and he heals them all and they all say, thank you for coming. Look what this says. And the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. Get out. By the way, the other gospels say that when they got there, they saw, and they only mentioned one of the men, but one of the men was sitting there clothed and in his right mind. He's, he's normal. They came out and saw this man who had been crazy, cutting himself, you know, and now he's normal. And you'd think they'd go, oh my gracious, he's normal, he's okay. But that's not what they say. They say, you killed our pigs. You killed our pigs. Look what it says. They wanted him to leave. See, the crowd wanted Jesus to leave. They didn't rejoice. 
They didn't bring the sick. They didn't go in and say, look, these two guys got well. Let's go get everybody else that's sick. Bring them up here and let him heal them too because he's obviously able to do that. No, they, they cared about the pigs. See, sometimes we care more about things than we care about people. Now, one of these men, look at his reaction now. Matthew doesn't tell us anything. Mark and Luke tell us some about it. But here's what this, this is man, one of the demon-possessed men from which it had gone out. It says, but the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging Jesus that he might accompany. He said, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. Look what you've done for me. But, but Jesus sent him away saying, go back to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. Go back and tell him what, what I did. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Now see, the people went back to the city said, the guy killed our pigs. This guy goes back and says, he healed me. He cast the demons out of me. Wow. See, we need to tell others what Jesus has done for us. See, you know what? We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one that seeks after God, whether you're two years old, five years old, seven years old, 12 years old, 19 years old, whatever it is. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we owe God death. Jesus Christ came and died for each one of us on the cross, paying for our sin, conquering death right when he rose from the grave, and offers a gift to every one of us. The gift is eternal life, and he says, whoever believes in me will never perish but have what? everlasting life. What should we tell people? Jesus Christ gave me everlasting life. I was dead in sin, and now I'm alive in Christ. How often do we tell people? How often we ought to be going out going, hey, I got some great news to tell you. Let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done for me. You know, there are a lot of ways to share your faith, and we, use the, we tell people, use John 3, 16, it's so simple. But you know, your story is a way to share your faith, to tell how you put your faith in Christ, how Jesus Christ has saved you. To me, this ends sad. It's good that these two men who were demon-possessed uh, now are, are normal, but what did the people say? Would you mind leaving? What if Jesus was here and we all said, thank you for coming, but we don't really want you here. Wow. What have we seen? Matthew shows us the power of Jesus Christ. Discipleship, following Jesus, cost us. Salvation is a gift. Uh, discipleship cost us. We've seen his power over the storm. We've seen the power over the demons. So let me give you some applications real quickly. First, let's understand the distinction between salvation and discipleship. Understand that salvation is a gift and discipleship costs us. Realize salvation is, costs us absolutely nothing. It's a gift. It's by faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life. Just understand that you trust in Jesus and you're saved and saved forever. While discipleship costs us our lives, it's, it's, it's our faithfulness. It's our agreeing to serve Jesus Christ. Now, B, uh, well, salvation is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, discipleship, take up your cross and, and offer your life. B is this, as believers, may we offer our lives to God. You know, uh, when people, when we proclaim the grace message, there are a lot of people who think it's too easy to tell people you just believe in Jesus Christ and you have eternal life. You trust in him and you're saved and saved forever. And so some people say, oh, y'all are making it too easy. I said, no, no, Jesus is the one who made it easy, okay? I mean, he, he died for us, paid for sin, rose again. He offers us a gift. But one of the things that sometimes people think is that when we say you're saved by grace through faith and you're saved forever, that we don't care about whether you grow or not or whether you serve or not. No. The whole purpose that you trusted in Christ to give you eternal life is now that as a child of God, you will live for him. And so I challenge all of us, we will live for Jesus Christ. The second thing, uh, to give your life for him, the second thing is let's trust Christ, God in the events of life. Listen, trust him why? Because he has all power. They didn't trust him. They were afraid they were going to drown. They thought, what are we going to do? Don't you care? We're perishing. He says, you look little faith. Trust me. There are events and things come in our lives every day that we got to trust him. He's working all things according to the counsel of his will. And last but not least, let's tell others what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has given to us eternal life. Now, there's so much more. 
that he's given us the Bible, he's given us the Holy Spirit, he's given us spiritual gifts, he's given us a local body, he's given us opportunities to serve him, he's given us all of these things. But one thing, especially in this passage, is that guy went back into that city and said, here's what Jesus Christ did for me. Let's tell others what Jesus Christ has done for us.